but I wanted to ask that question. Here comes Senator Westman. All right. So good morning. Uh, it is Friday, March 19th. It's 9.02 a.m. And this is a meeting at Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, we're here with members of the um, Department of Environmental Conservation to talk about municipal water and wastewater connections and NEPTES permits. Um, uh, so thank you all for coming in. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of interest in the building inside and outside the state house uh, related to triggered by S10, um, the economic, the development committee's bill on housing. Um, and this committee has talked with you all about um, and heard testimony about the system. And I think what would be helpful to us is to uh, first just kind of walk through the lay of the land again, because I think part of what's causing some anxiety is the notion that um, what the bill does is review, re diminishes the level at which we consider whether or not a wastewater treatment facility and system can accept any new connections. So we're, I call it conflating the plumbing at the private end with the capacity of the entire system to operate within compliance of law. So maybe we could, uh, I'll stop on the recreating the confusing things people are talking about and uh, ask you to proceed through and describe the system and why you believe it um, delivers the kind of service we need to Vermonters who are, who are all interested in keeping water clean. So Commissioner Walk, do you wanna lead off? Sure, and I, I thank you, Senator Brennan. I appreciate the opportunity to come back in and provide some, some, some more answers to your questions. Uh, for the record, Peter Walk, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, I am joined by uh, Brian Redman and Amy Pelagic, um, who can speak directly to the requirements of, of the, the current permitting system and what is proposed. And then ultimately, uh, Amy's got answers to your questions about sort of the ancillary pieces that have come up as part of this discussion around capacity, around um, 1272 orders. I understand that's come up a couple of times and sort of where we're going on CSOs generally so that everybody can have a sense of, of understanding of what's happening and hopefully inform your decision-making going forward. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna ask Brian to just walk through uh, where, where we are and what's proposed, where we are now with the current system and then what's proposed. Good morning, Mr. Redman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, committee members. For the record, my name is Brian Redman. I'm the director for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. Um, the testimony on section 10 and 11 of this bill has dramatically broadened in, in its scope. And I wanted to begin by focusing on the substance of these provisions and outline the current process used for approving connections. Under current regulations, a connection permit is required for the construction of a new water or wastewater service connection to a public water system or wastewater systems. For, project, for projects requiring construction, and this includes the new connections or modifications to existing connections, a state WW permit is required. As I testified to last week, state review of the connection permit is focused on the technical aspects of the installation. In instances where a state permit is required, typically the landowner engages the, service, the services of a qualified consultant to design the connection, including the evaluation of the design flow associated with the new use and the physical infrastructure. And when I say physical infrastructure in this context, I'm talking the infrastructure from the building or structure connecting into the sanitary sewer collection line. Uh, and the, the, the review and the design is to make sure that that infrastructure is adequate to serve the new use. Plans and specifications for the connection are then developed and an application is filed with the state for a permit. A required component of the application is the allocation letter from the serving municipality, where the municipality confirms they have the reserve treatment and hydraulic capacity to serve the new use. 
Typically, these letters concur with the calculated design flow for the connection that's provided by the consultant, and the municipality allocates to the landowner sewer transmission and treatment capacity to accommodate the increase in design flow. Assuming all other technical information is in order, the permit is issued. These permits are issued under state authority on Title 10, Chapter 64, and are not required by the Clean Water Act. From a practical perspective, the only change that occurs as a result of section in 10, uh, sections 10 and 11 of S-101 will be to transfer the responsibility of approving connections to municipalities who choose to register for this program. It will be the municipality, not the state, that is responsible to ensure the uniform technical, uh, uniform technical standards are met for the connection. As you've heard from uh, testimony provided by the municipalities, in many cases, the review conducted by the state is redundant to the review that is connected, uh, sorry, occurring at the municipal level. So that really explains the current process related to connections. So I think I'll stop there and happy to answer questions. Sure, I do have a quick question. So there was one step I hadn't really heard about before. And did you say that the municipality issues a letter affirming the capacity of the system to accept the new uh, use or, yeah, basically new use, whether it's a change of use or new construction entirely? Correct, yes, that's that's part of the WW permitting process for connections. It's um, what we call an allocation letter. Uh, there's not necessarily a standardized form, but typically what we see is a design flow calculation that's provided by the applicant, uh, usually their consultant. And the municipality reviews those calculations and concurs that they um, agree with the calculation and that they have the hydraulic and treatment capacity to serve this, this new use. Okay, so the engineer issues a letter saying what the the impacts would be. The municipality reviews that uh, allocation letter to ensure that they have the capacity to accept the connection or change. And, um, and when they are uh, accepting or denying that new, that new connection, does that relate to the terms under which they're licensed through their or permitted through their NEPTES permit? Is that sort of the, the ground for saying yay or nay to, all, to the, the new request? Yes, correct. And uh, th just as a point of clarification, the allocation letter comes to us from the, from the municipality that will be handling the waste of this okay. new use. So it's a, okay. a letter actually issu issued by the municipality, not the, the landowner or the applicant. Okay. And so under the proposed change, the municipality basically, it becomes an internal process where they examine the affirmation. Who's making the affirmation? <laughs> Is it gonna be the same person probably at a municipal level who says, um, I know what the capacity of that plant is. I'm looking at the letter from the designer and I'm affirming that the two, um, that, you know, there's a capacity there to make that new connection. So it becomes entirely internal as opposed to that person reviewing it and sending you a letter to affirm that. Correct, yes. I mean, for the most part, they're issued out of the public works department at the okay. level. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Senator McDonald. Yep. What is, I've heard what you've said and I understand it. What is not being said in this permitting process? Um, the, we know that plants have their licenses, their permits have expired. And they haven't been, they haven't, some haven't even applied for new permits. We know that when wastewater goes into these plants and it rains, um, it goes into the river. Um, so is there a notwithstanding in this whole process that says, yes, this, this connection is not gonna leak and no sewage is gonna go into the environment um, it's going to go straight into the plant, and it's not. It's not going to leak, and um, and we all know that when many of these plants get sewage in them, they release into the river. So what's the disconnection here? That that um, no pun intended. Uh, what 
what is not being said about this process? Because every time we, we hear from the witnesses, they say these these requirements are to you know provide, guarantee, make secure, um, prevent um, pollution, and so they, they don't. They don't. They simply say that the pollution will that, that we're not paying any attention to is will be. Um, marginally larger than it would have been if we hadn't connected these plants, but the, the plants are certifying that they have the capacity to treat this, but they don't treat it. So what's, what am I, what am, what's being overlooked here? Senator McDonald, if, if I may, I, I think Amy will provide some additional information in, during her testimony on specific to your question, and we can get into some more detail then um, about what, that side of, of the action. We're, we're explaining the, I think as Brad was going through the sort of current evaluation that's happening now and the proposed change in statute. And and I, there are lots of ancillary issues that we can talk through and Amy is happy to go through those in more depth. We always seem to talk through the easy stuff and <laughs> never get to the other stuff. Thank you. Well, that, Thank you. That, I guess that, that's our commitment to you is we, we're hoping to talk through it, but as it relates to this particular bill, the, the change is, is, is as I address it. If, if there are other things that you want to work on to address the broader system, then that's, that's, that's a related but different conversation. Okay. So um, understood, and uh, that makes sense. Uh, before we go on to that bigger conversation that Senator McDonald's alluding to. Um, I just want to dot the I's, cross the T's. Uh, the committee's understanding was that the proposed amendment we may, we're offering um, is a way of ensuring that the same qualification, that whomever is making uh, an affirmation of capacity to connect without any kind of ill effects and to remain within permit, the NFTs permit, um, that we're, we're making that explicit. doesn't matter whether it's at the A&R end of things or out at the municipal end. So that was one thing. I just, let me pause and say, from your perspective, have we achieved that by specifying the qualifications? Yes, I, I think um, it, it, it's it's synonymous with what's required under the current process, regulatory process under A&R that um, an individual uh, with the appropriate qualifications is evaluating uh, the connection and, and certifying that uh, it meets the standards. Right, right. And I think, you know, I think my understanding was this would have always been the case, but it was implicit. If they were going to meet A&R's rules, then they would have to sort of recapitulate them at the local level. So, it will, but now we're seeing it explicitly in black and white. So that's helpful. Um, the other piece we address in there is there were concerns expressed around the visibility to the public of any such proposed connections. So we added some language about, in short, when you're posting your building permit, post your uh, the wastewater permit um, along with it. Um, is that seem like a sound solution to you? I mean, actually, so let me pause there. Yeah, I, I guess what I would say, it is a bit of a deviation from um, what's currently required at the state level uh, under Act 150. Uh, these permits are exempt from posting on the uh, environmental notice bulletin. Right. Um, the state WW permits are one of the permits that uh, are not required. I think in large part uh, due to quantity, uh, there are... Um, the connection permits are only a very small subset of what this program does. It, it permits um, uh, the soil-based wastewater serving over half of monitors um, and their potable water supplies. So the program issues between 2,500 and 3,000 permits annually. Uh, so it's a very high traffic program. And uh, the current requirement is that those are not posted to the environmental notice bulletin. Um, except when there may be overshadowing effects um, on, a, on a neighboring property from a new water well. Um, right, so I think in, in this case, we're leaning into it a little bit in terms of if there's concern, at least as we're proposing it, it makes the process more visible. Um, 
if it turns out that a year or two or three uh, from now, if someone says, well, this really isn't as functional as we thought, I think what we're trying to be is um, extra transparent and make sure that if people have concerns, they'll have a way of seeing exactly what's being issued for connections. Okay. And so then that leads us, I think, to the bigger question of, um, so here we are with all this fine-tuned regulatory apparatus, and then people say, well, how could we possibly have CSOs? And I think the committee knows the answer. They're part of a design, but can we talk about that? Um, so, good morning, Ms. Polachek. Good morning. I think that's where I come in. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I've prepared just some visual aids for those who are like me and um, find it helpful to have a visual while we're having the conversation. And if it doesn't make things too challenging, I also have some prepared remarks that I will use. Great. Um, so Good morning and thank you again for inviting me to provide additional testimony on this subject today. Uh, for the record, my name is Amy Polacek and I'm the manager of the Wastewater Management Program in the Watershed Management Division of DEC. This morning I'll discuss wastewater, permit, wastewater treatment facilities and permitting those facilities, which is distinctly different from permitting connections to those facilities. So the key points of my testimony today is, are that municipalities have dry weather hydraulic capacity. And as Brian mentioned, the current process requires municipalities to confirm they have reserved treatment and hydraulic capacity to serve new connections. These changes proposed in sections 10 and 11 transfer the responsibility of approving connections to municipalities who choose to register. The NIPTES permits that permit the discharges from the receiving wastewater facilities require those facilities to be operated below the dry weather hydraulic capacity for the facility. And CSOs are not a function of dry weather capacity. And moreover, compliance with the 2016 CSO rule to comply CSO discharges is actively underway. And I'll provide details as to where we are with the implementation of that rule. So the, re the reissuance of permits for facilities discharging to Lake Champlain is a top priority for the wastewater management program. And the majority of these permits have been issued. Those are presented in the highlighted, uh, highlighted in green in the table I'm sharing with you. We anticipate to have all of them complete by the end of this year. Now, the issue of- uh, may, I'm sorry, may I ask a quick question on that? Um, so I happen to be over here in the outer area of the, the region of the Otter Creek. Uh, are, can you just explain how the, the choice, uh, is it, yeah, how, how is it that Otter Creek is kind of uni uniformly not uh, um, up to date, or I don't know what to call it. up to date is pejorative, but it has, they don't have current permits issued. So What's the thinking there in terms of uh, not getting to that group yet versus doing some other ones first? Certainly, Mr. Chair. This um, is the, a table taken from the phase one implementation plan that was agreed upon with the US EPA at the outset of Act 64 or the Lake Champlain TMDL implementation. And Otter Creek was placed last in the schedule. It was a five-year schedule. And Otter Creek was, was um, by design placed last. Um, and we are currently working through the assessments behind those permits now and drafting those permits at this time. And so my understanding from the testimony of Mr. Wenberg previously this in this um, committee was that, that was those were placed at the end of the implementation schedule because of the level of impact of those facilities. I wasn't with the agency at that time. Okay. 
I mean, does that mean sort of that these were maybe some of the biggest challenges to address? So it, more time was given to get to them or I don't know if someone can just sort of plain speak <laughs> how they ended up sort of going as the last group. I definitely, they're not the most complex permits to issue. Those were these that we are working, have worked through in the um, Winooski Basin and the Otter Creek. In fact, those facilities, many of them are smaller um, aside from Rutland and um, Right. I can go into more detail if you have additional questions there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Chair. So moving on to discussion of a hydraulic loading of facilities, the authorization of connections in H101 is related to the dry weather hydraulic loading of wastewater treatment facilities. The wastewater treatment facilities in Vermont are designed for growth and therefore over-designed in most cases. On average, facilities receive about 50% or less of their designed dry weather hydraulic capacity. And if a facility is consistently over their design capacity, they're required to begin planning an upgrade to their facility per a permit condition that I have presented on this slide in italics. This condition functionally limits a facility to 80% of their hydraulic capacity in order to assure the treatment plant stays in the hydraulic design range where treatment is most efficient. Given that most facilities are below their dry weather hydraulic capacities, they are, are, they are capable of accepting additional flow and the, the municipalities are in the best position to know just how much additional flow they can accommodate. They see the variations in these plants each day. They know the budgets, the permit requirements, and know what resources are needed to meet them. The towns also know the collection systems best they understand the sections of the collection system that present issues and where it is prudent or ill-advised to approve additional connections. These collection systems are doing what they were designed to do. At the time they were constructed, it was preferable to collect stormwater when the conveyance system and the wastewater treatment facility could accommodate it. And when it couldn't have combined sewer overflows rather than bypassing treatment facilities or backing up into homes and businesses. This was the engineering standard at the time, and there's no easier and expensive way to turn back the clock on this design. However, we are actively addressing this issue by implementing the 2016 CSO rule through legally enforceable 1272 orders that compel facilities to bring their CSOs into compliance with the Vermont water quality standards. The Vermont CSO rule defines CSO discharges as non-compliant with the Vermont water quality standards. It requires each community develop a long-term control plan that identifies specific projects to control or remove CSOs, a timeline for implementation, and a financing plan. These plans are iterative with projects proposed for a five to 10 period to be reevaluated as the set of projects are completed. These iter this iterative process allows municipalities and their consultants to focus on the biggest problem areas first, observe system response and weather trends, and then make thoughtful investments on how to proceed with these costly projects. Every CSO community in the state is making progress towards abatement. You'll notice that on the table I've presented on the slide, Springfield is not listed. They became a CSO-free community in 2019 after decades of effort and millions of dollars of infrastructure investment. Other CSO communities are making good progress in development and implementation of their long-term control plans. And Vermont has made significant progress towards eliminating CSO discharges and continues to be a leader in the region in bringing them into compliance with water quality standards. Um, a quick question so and a long-term control plan is is that <clears throat> synonymous with a 1272 the 1272 orders require long-term control plans and lay out the requirements for the detail required in those plans once those plans are finalized with the towns and submitted to us we issue an updated 1272 plan that includes the the schedule proposed in the long-term control plan and then puts those dates as requirements within the new 1272 order. So 
the long-term control plan then becomes a legal, legally enforceable compliance schedule for that, that town to um, meet. Okay. Um, and let me when, just double when, check. When does the town have to meet it? It depends on their funding and the projects. So the timeline of the 12, of the plans that we're working with towns on now are generally five to 10 years. And after that period of time, we go back, the plan is to reassess and continue to update the long-term control plan and update the 1272 through an iterative process. Um, so if a region or um, is, I won't name names uh, over this way, but there's towns where CSO events have been a topic of ongoing conversation, dissatisfaction for anyone whose focus is on recreation, water quality, and uh, at, the, at the municipal level, it's usually, this is too expensive for us to go ahead. So uh, how, how is that, <laughs> how do those two competing things happen, you know, get <laughs> sorted out? Are, are towns ever compelled to act? You say, well, we recognize it's expensive, we have a revolving loan fund. You must make an investment. Does that happen? Yes. The, well, there are guidelines from the EPA on um, the mean household income and funding and expectations mm -hmm. for timing of implementation of, of projects. Mm -hmm. We work with municipalities to connect them with the water infrastructure division and funding available. And um, we don't have any towns that have been reticent to develop or implement their long-term control plans. Everyone that, that we are working with, we're working with collegially and we find that they're proposing projects that will make differences in the water quality. And when they don't, we provide them that feedback and require a, a revised 12 seven or long-term control plan. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, uh, our, Senator, Senator Bray, it might also be important to, to remember that a 12, we, we use the term 1272 order to like all of your viewing audience understands what it is. That is an enforcement action. Um, so that is how we hold those communities accountable to clean up what is an un, unpermitted discharge from the CSO. Okay. Um, and let me just, <laughs> so you're pointing something out. I think CSOs themselves are permitted. Is that correct? No. The, no. the okay. CSO release is an unpermitted discharge, which is why we are, why we, why we have enforcement orders in place to, to deal with them. Um, okay, so my un earlier, obviously incomplete understanding was that these systems are designed to sort of, you know, quote unquote, protect themselves in heavy rain events. So they anticipated um, CSOs. I mean, it's part of a strategy to protect the infrastructure. So I, I'm, a little, I'm trying to puzzle this one out how they're actually a, a violation of sorts, but they're also, were part of the design. We've told the design was antiquated and that were for, made for uh, years ago for different circumstances. We understand that that's what happened. So the question is, How much more stuff can you put into plants that were antiquated and um, for times long ago in a different era and say that we're cleaning up water and that the permitting process is hunky-dory and, um, and we're in enforcement will be in five to 10 years. I, you know, I know this is the position we're in, but why do we not say that? Why do we come up with all these long and then and not, and not post what's happening so that citizens can come in and say, ask the same questions we're trying to ask today. Or 
And I guess the answer is because we, the legislature, say that's okay. Uh, Commissioner Watt, do you want to take a swing at that, or or maybe not? <laughs> I'm I'm not entirely clear on what the question was. Yeah. Uh, I I have two two analogies, and I'll say I, I go back to a cartoon. I remember where the sign at the hamburger stand says, "Hamburgers not touched by human hands." And then you look in the back room, and there's a gorilla making hamburgers. The other one is, it's like promising to quit smoking, but I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to do it in five to 10 years. It says who? Um, I made a promise. I, I signed an affidavit that I wasn't, I was going to quit smoking in five to 10 years. Um, uh, so what's, um, what's that? How is that different not, from I'm what we gonna, have now? I'm not going to touch the, the hamburger, the hamburger <laughs> one, but I, I because it's not I, touched by human hands, of course you won't touch it. <laughs> but it, this this isn't a commitment to 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 deal with this issue in five to ten years. This is a commitment to be on a full plan from now to that ten year period, recognizing that 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 communities don't have either the financial or the logistic capacity to be able to tear up all of their streets to get to these solutions right away. So that is a that's a reality piece, but it's not a wait till that five or ten year point and then and then figure it out. It's a throughout the process and to get there. So in the meantime, we're putting more stuff in a bag that's not big enough to hold it. The it, 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 the way we permit is as as Amy described is based uh, in terms of capacity is based on that dry flows. That is the permitted discharge from a wastewater treatment facility. A CSO discharge is an unpermitted discharge. The systems were designed that way. That does not mean that it's a permitted discharge. Thank you. Um, can is the state revolving loan fund depleted? In other words, is all the money of in it been put to use addressing situations like this? Um, no, as and and as you know, as Amy can attest to, the there it's not. It's often a a question of project phasing. It takes a while to design and prepare for construction. And as as I think you all well know, the 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 requirements associated, the federal requirements associated with getting a loan from us take time. So it's not as if you know we we make this decision and it happens tomorrow for a number of logistics and financial reasons. But there is money available um, as these projects come forward, and we think it's a great opportunity to make this investment with some of the the federal dollars that are coming. Uh, that were a little unclear as to sort of they're listed as water and sewer sort of dollars. It would be great to use some of those that that money to make these investments to clean up so that we don't have these unpermitted discharges, and um, so that we we can so that we cut out that that concern that you have, Senator McDonald, about the the process. Okay. Well, before I go to uh, Senator McDonald, just a quick follow up. I mean, Senator McCormick. Um, the fact that the fund has money, we, we know, right, that makes a lot of sense. There are complicated projects, there's lead time, but it seems like we have towns that you know promised to quit smoking five years ago. And so I don't know why the money, you know, there's been, there's enough need out there for enough projects in enough locations. I would have thought we would be sort of maximizing the use of those dollars. It seems as though somehow we're not expending all the money that we could. And I don't know what the, I, the I don't reason think I for that is. I don't think I would characterize it that way. And, and Brian's got lots of experience in the, in, in the SRF world and may have some, some more insight to add, but the, we, we lend out a lot of money over the course of every year. It is designed to be a revolving loan fund. So we don't want to fully deplete uh, right. that capital um, so that we can continue to grow it and continue to lend it out and offer it in terms that 
that that are advantageous to getting projects done that don't fully replenish the dollars in the fund so that we can make these pro get these projects moving especially okay. for our, our communities that are struggling okay um senator mccormick thank you for waiting first um I guess a full disclosure, um, I was chair of this committee uh, 20 years ago. And one of the issues we dealt with then was stormwater runoff. And it was not specifically uh, wastewater, but the stormwater runoff often, as we have discussed, is taken in by the uh, wastewater facilities. And um, at the time, I thought we had done a great job because I felt very strongly that it was not just our job to protect the environment, but that we had to do so in a way that would make business and municipalities happy as well. And the way we, we achieved that or thought we had uh, was by not demanding an, an immediate results, but by um, getting a commitment from municipalities that they would deal with it. Um, We've been using the figure five years this morning. Um, it's been 20. And as far as I can see, we are worse off now than we were 20 years ago. Uh, I also operate on the notion, and this is not my original bon mot. I think it's James Madison, actually. But it's no, no one should be a judge in his own case. And um, the idea of the municipalities, uh, who I regard as, as applicants, uh, essentially self-permitting, um, I, I, it strikes me that we're making them the, um, the judges in their own case. I do know, I, I will stipulate uh, uh, that um, they probably do know more about their facility than anybody else does. Uh, I think that probably the, uh, the bureaucracy knows more about everything than the legislatures. Uh, we're not the experts. Uh, when I taught this in, in the, uh, college courses on state government, I would say to my students, since uh, my main qualification for public office is that I played guitar at every wedding in Windsor County, and I can consume three church suppers in one night, um, why don't we just let the bureaucrats write the law? They're the experts. And the answer is no one elected them. But they are the experts. So we, who stand in for the people, take testimony from the experts because they are the experts. And we listen carefully and we take notes and we make our judgments accordingly. And so I guess my inclination is that the applicants, the municipalities, should make their case to the state rather than self-permit. And uh, because ultimately um, it's, it's, it's um, the state's responsibility and not the municipalities. Now, I'm prepared to be convinced otherwise. And that's not, I'm not being snide. I really mean I'm prepared. As illustrated 20 years ago, I supported a bill that was in many ways a major concession on environmental protection um, because I thought it would please the municipalities, please the Chamber of Commerce, and everybody would be win win and everybody would be on board. Um, so I am capable of, of, of compromise, I'm capable of having my mind changed. What I would like, and I don't know if it could be done this morning verbally. Uh, but I would like kind of a side by side, who controls what now, who will control what if this bill passes as written. And I, that's an, if you, if you want to take a stab at that, that would be good if, if that's a bit too complicated for a quick droll testimony, then perhaps a memo uh, following short. But, but of course, time is of the essence here too. Um, I guess that's that's all I have to say. If someone would like to explain to me what exactly, how much jurisdiction the state is yielding, and and uh, and where where that jurisdiction goes, 
and how we will not have less environmental protection as a result. Um, I'm all ears. So, uh, so Senator McCormick, thanks for your question. I, I think Brian uh, went through through that in his testimony, but he can go through it again. Essentially, there are two pieces to the connections permitting process. The evaluation of the technical standards of that connection and the evaluation of the, the treatment capacity. And currently we are doing the evaluation of the technical standards. We understand that some communities are doing that as well, currently. That's where that, that duplication piece comes in. The second piece is the capacity piece and we are relying on the information provided to us, to us the state by the municipal officials, public works departments who are providing that information as to the available capacity. So that, that, would, that would not change as part of this, this proposed change to the law. So if I understand, the state now makes the decision based on information from the municipality. And if the bill passes, the municipality will make the decision based on its own information. And, and, uh, and conformance with our design standards associated with the technical aspects of the physical connection, yes. Who makes the determination that it's in conformance? They, they have to comply with, with, this, with the state standards. Who makes the determination that they have? So the, the city would do that, or the municipal? They, they, they would be a judge in their own, they would be a judge in their own case. This, this is for the hookup what we're talking about, right? Correct. Yeah, no they, one, we're they not they asking seen... questions about the hookup. We're asking questions about the result of the hookup. Well, I, I think we have two different sets of questions. Senator McCormick's on the hookup yeah. phase, and you're talking about the CSO phase, as best I can follow here. Yeah. So well, it comes down to, in a way, that the allocation letter. I mean, right now, you're relying on the allocation letter from the, the municipality to make your sign off, correct? So I don't know, unless <laughs> unless you go out and do field audits on allocation letters and make sure that they're accurate, it, it seems as though there's no less level of rigor in that piece of the process, because in both cases, the design must now come from a qualified uh, professional engineer or licensed designer, right? Well, as, as I said earlier in the, in the week, I, I do feel I'm not standing on particularly solid ground in advocating for state jurisdiction because I don't think the state is doing a stellar job either. But it is an independent, uh, supposedly independent, separate um, uh, uh, judge. It's well, not running back and forth from the witness stand to the judge's bench. <laughs> so if I can just nail down this piece before we go back to Senator McDonald. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Redmond, does the agency ever go out and uh, say, we just want to make sure these allocation letters have been issued accurately um, or... Or is that not part of the process now in terms of oversight? No, it's not part of the process any longer. I mean, there were days many, many years ago where the agency was tracking individual allocations to wastewater treatment plants, but those, um, it's not a good place to position to be in. And we, we stopped doing that decades ago. Um, I, our current, and just to address Senator McCormick's question, a little bit more directly. The current process is it's two parts. We rely on the municipality for that hydraulic and treatment capacity allocation. And then the landowner is submitting an application with the design and the technical standards that the state is then reviewing conformance for um, that project with those standards. So it's, it's, it's two parts. There's a submittal from the land, um, typically their consultant, and then as part of the application, this allocation comes in from, from the municipality. Um, the other point that I, I would make um, under current law, this was talked about um, in our previous testimony, is there are provisions currently that exist for both delegation, for full delegation, for the, uh, a municipality to administer 
uh, the chapter one environmental protection rules. We have, um, that would include the soil-based and connections. We have two communities that are enrolled in that program in Charlotte and um, Colchester. And then we also have provisions for partial delegation, which is very specific to these connections. And we don't have any communities enrolled in that. So what this bill is doing is providing a, um, a I, I guess I, I would call it a more streamlined approach to assume those, that responsibility over uh, partial delegation. Um, Mr. Urban, you just mentioned that, that there'll still be an application to a &R by the landowner for the project. And did you say that as part of that, they would be citing the waste, the, the connections, um, the allocation letter, or in this case, now it would be a, a statement by the municipality that, that they can, uh, in fact, correct that it's appropriate for them to be connecting because they have a valid design, et cetera. So does the state see this in some way anyway, uh, whether it was certified by the municipality or delivered to you as an allocation letter? Under, under current process, the, the application for the connection comes from the landowner with a letter from the municipality certifying to capacity. And what this, what this yeah. bill would establish um, is basically a direct relationship between the landowner and the municipality for right. the connection of that building or structure to their wastewater treatment system. Um, so it basically would, um, in fact, um, eliminate the state's oversight and involvement over that particular connection. Okay. Um, the, the language this committee proposed actually in the public posting piece refers to the applicant for the permit, uh, the party that makes the application, not the landowner specifically. I was also asked a question in economic development, whether or not that was appropriate. Um, and my understanding was that we were modeling this after how we handle building permits and that the reference to the applicant as opposed to the landowner was to accommodate cases in which some party, perhaps a project manager or general contractor was on behalf of the landowner handling this sort of uh, aspect of the construction project. Am I on the right track or am I, do I need, am I missing a piece here? No, I think that's the, the, the right track. I, we, we typically use the term landowner in this program, but applicant, I think, is, is, um, is, is, is fine. I, I, the, the key point is that the, the, the notification occurs and it's, it's publicly visible to the people that are interested in seeing, seeing it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Senator McCormick, anything more on that particular puzzle that you wanted to to work on before we go back to Senator McDonald's line of questioning? No, let's go back to Mark. Okay. So Senator McDonald, I, um, do you wanna follow up in terms of- I, I'm, Yeah, um, if I were, I'm, this is, I will apologize in advance to uh, um, uh, Amy Polzak. Could you pronounce that for me, please? <laughs> I'm not for my, um, I don't, I'm not apologizing for failing to do the name correctly, but um, um, the, the witness from the Department of Environmental Conservation is telling us that, um, that is endorsing a policy which says that we're gonna quit smoking in five to 10 years and that we should go ahead and continue to, um, uh, to do what we're doing because there's money in the fund and there's money that's going to be there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that doesn't, that's not a environmental cons, uh, environmental conservation watchdog activity. Their job is to prevent pollution, not to tell the legislature um, that everything's okay because we have a plan that in five or 10 years from now is going to take care of it all. Um, my guess is, like Senator McCormick has said, when he chaired this committee, that he was told that there was a plan 
to take care of this. And here we are years later, and we're be, the legislature is being told that there's a plan to take care of this. And by the watchdogs, you know, by the people whose job it is to say what's wrong and how much the pollution is, and we're being told everything's okay, that we have a plan. Um, I sent someone a text here a few moments ago that says, we say there's money in the revolving fund, and but we're not spending it. And perhaps we're not spending it because if we spent it, then we'd have to say there's no money in the revolving fund. Um, I, I don't expect we're gonna solve the problem that we're talking about today, that there isn't the will to do that, that there isn't the money, that the plan has no teeth, that the administration is not committed to raising the money and we're not committed to requiring them to do it. Um, but we will not tell anybody. We'll get up on the floor and we will say that this is a simple matter to connect something that's been connected satisfactory that doesn't leak, that is well is welded and works to send more wastewater into a plant that was designed 20 years ago and is that fa is failing and that we have that we promise you um, we're assuring you we want to convince you that it'll all be taken care of in five to ten years now I don't know what you call that but um, but it, it doesn't it's a, to not call it out for what it is and that is none of the players that are on this on this TV um, other than the legislators are um, are at fault for what they're saying. It just isn't true that what they are saying is going to happen is going to happen. It's, it is, uh, and we don't want to admit it. And then we run for office and say, we think these things are important and we're committed to re resolving them. And then we punt. So, or we accept as truth that which we believe is not going to happen. Uh, Senator Campion. It seems to me, and I think uh, Commissioner Walk mentioned this, uh, that we have, we're going to have a big opportunity before us with regard to federal funds coming in and really making some uh, massive, possibly infrastructure uh, changes that could help us with these issues. And I'm I'm just wondering when we might have a, an understanding of what the possibilities uh, of this are, because I know as it relates to education and other things that we're thinking about um, having, you know, these, these, these can really be game changers. So um, I'll leave it there and wondering if the chair or perhaps the commissioner might have an idea of, and, and this isn't, I'm not asking because you should know by now, I'm just, when we, you might have an idea of, you know, the dollars that might be available for this kind of work. Right. So let me give a quick answer and then turn it over to Commissioner Walk. So um, actually since yesterday, I'm working with our committee assistant to schedule in uh, staff of all three members of our congressional delegation to talk about opportunities to address natural resource issues, including this one uh, in terms of the streams of money that are coming out of DC. I mean, it's a complicated picture and some have already been issued and we're trying to figure out what the, the boundaries are in terms of how they're being spent. There's other funds still being discussed that haven't yet materialized in the form of a bill. I'm thinking about stuff along the lines of Green New Deal, things where there'd be an obvious connection for our committee. And I want it, I'll do it while we're here because I was going to reach out to Commissioner Walk and invite him to join us um, when we have the delegation in so that we'll have everyone at the same table at the same time hearing that information. Um, and I believe, so we're, we're working for a date. It's a little tricky to get everyone in the same place at the same time, but I hope it's next uh, week. Uh, right now we're aiming for Thursday. We'll find out. So thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, Commissioner Walk. I would, I would welcome the opportunity to participate in that. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, 
Senator Campion, you're absolutely right. There, there, while there, there is money available for loans, uh, as, as many of you know from talking to your communities, even taking on low interest loans uh, in the capacity that a community has to spend. And we look at things like that medium, median household income that, that Amy talked about to understand what's an affordable level of cost for these type of systems and trying to understand how, how that's possible. How do we get to those, those things done? The, the loans aren't enough. Uh, they weren't built with loans. They were primarily built with grants. And so these communities are having to adapt to, to a system that has changed on them and that they, you know, that we have been working with them on uh, doing better, doing better jobs of sort of doing long-term plans to understand what their assets are and how they're going to manage them over a course of time, so that they don't have these huge slugs of of capital need at different points. But this really is game-changing potential money. We we don't have a ton of detail, frankly, right now. Um, but that's that's the system we're in, and and. You know, to, to Senator McDonald, I just want to say to you that we're not in here saying that we don't think there's a problem with CSOs. We think there is a problem with CSOs, which is why there's an enforcement system in place to address them. They just can't be changed overnight in a way that that is that is satisfactory to everybody. And we're working to it as fast as we can, but we will hold them accountable to those to those 1272 orders and their plans. May I ask a follow-up? Yes, please, Senator Campion. Commissioner, uh, is there a, you know, when we're looking at things down the hall in Ed, you know, we've specified, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of clarified certain buildings, certain, uh, you know, buildings that need to be revamped for air quality, lead, things like that. Do we have a, a similar list that the committee could see around what municipalities are in the greatest danger of having um, uh, overflow, ex, you know, problems? Uh, really need upgrades? Do we have something like that? I, we, I, we, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, certainly, Amy's program has a ton of data on on what has been reported to us in terms of issues associated with CSO releases. Uh, issues that sort of associated with compliance with with various permitting pieces. I mean, we we deal with this all the time. We permit limits and we enforce those that that, that ex on those that exceed those limits. And the, there's an, the you know obviously a lot of data about that, and certainly can talk through those. I know you know organizations like the League of Cities and Towns and uh, the Green Mountain Water Environment Association and Vermont Rural Water, et cetera, will have some of that information from their members as well as to where their needs are. And we're, we're interested in engaging that conversation too to understand where people see needs, where they, who they can prioritize because as this ARPA money goes out, we wanna make sure it's going out in, the, in a prioritized way. You know, as we all, see the results of the era funding that went out in the end of the 2009-2010 sort of uh, era went um, needed to go very quickly and so often went to what was available rather than what were the priorities and I think that's an exercise that we hope to be able to better accomplish this time around. Thanks I really appreciate that because I think there are areas that we could prioritize and and uh, you know I think about broadband we all look at the broadband map all the time, whether you're in finance, education, or approach, uh, you know, where the needs are for expansion. And, you know, if we could sort of start to identify or put some priority uh, categories uh, or whatever uh, around certain areas, I think it, it would be great. And I, and I like that sort of strategic approach. Um, thank you for that. Right. So I think that's a helpful suggestion. And I think, Mr. Redmond, you are going to put together that sort of side-by-side -side proposed versus current. That would be helpful. Um, Mr. Redmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could, uh, just to bring us back on the connections one last time, uh, I just want to make absolutely clear uh, what we're really talking about here is having um, a designer or an engineer consultant, engineering consultant prepare a plan for the connection 
that is then submitted to the municipality, not the state for review. Uh, and I just, you know, the municipalities, um, in my experience over 15 years working in this field of, of water and wastewater infrastructure, uh, my experience with the public works officials around the state have been that they have an inherent interest to make sure that that infrastructure functions appropriately as designed. Uh, and I don't know if that's necessarily been the light that's been cast um, over the last few weeks. And I just want to make absolutely clear that they have a, a, a staked interest in making sure that those systems function. Uh, and my experience has been that they're not looking to have something come onto their system that is substandard. So I just wanted to put that out there um, on the record that that has been my experience working with Vermont Towns. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one quick sort of detailed question on, on the uh, capacity for a connection. Does that also look at the nature of the effluent? So, you know, I'm thinking about uh, in Burlington where the biooxidative demand of the material, the effluent placed the load on the system. Is that a routine part of the review process as well? well would an engineer, for instance, uh, take that into account in doing their assessment? Yeah, so I, I can start and Amy, feel free to chime in on, on pretreatment, but um, the answer is yes, that is the treatment capacity side. Um, the hydraulic is one side, but the treatment capacity is the other. So when anytime there is high strength waste involved, uh, that is certainly a consideration of bringing on uh, a, connect, a new connection onto a system. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chair, I can add on to yes. that by if there is a connection that proposes to discharge high strength or high concentration biochemical oxygen demand to the facility, we do have a permitting program in place in the wastewater management program. It's called the pretreatment, industrial pretreatment program that issues permits with allocation letters from towns determining how much BOD or biochemical oxygen demand that facility can receive and then requires pretreatment of that waste to reduce the BOD coming to the treatment facility in order to protect the facility and ensure that it can still meet its effluent limits. Great. I think we might have that same situation down in Middlebury, for instance, at the cheese factory, right? Uh, okay. Yes. All right. So uh, any other questions on municipal and water and wastewater connections, NEPTES permits. We didn't really get to um, the, could you speak to the issue of permits being expired, which creates kind of a, uh, an, um, I guess I'll just say it sort of in a simple way. It doesn't sound good to people to hear that someone's sort of drying, driving with their license expired. So, um, but uh, my understanding is that's not, Legally, that's not quite where we are. So can you say what, what their status is? They're legally continued or something like that. And we don't know that piece of the story. And what does that mean? Sure. Um, the, when a permit expires um, prior to expiration, the permittee is required to reapply for coverage and for renewal of that permit. So long as that application is received prior to the expiration of the permit and is deemed administrative and technically complete, that, in, that current permit is then administratively continued. All of the conditions and limits remain in force and until the permit is acted upon by, for renewal. And, um, you know, many of the permits that are waiting for renewal in the Otter Creek Basin that was by design as TMDLs were issued, um, then stayed and then re reissued. And so we do have outstanding permits that need to be renewed. Uh, but it is a high priority for my program to act upon those as soon as we have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Okay. Um, is there any, 
I, I don't know what, unintended consequences of letting them operate under a continued uh, permit as opposed to being issued a new permit. Um, might the terms and conditions change? So someone might argue that someone's, I don't know, over emitting um, by virtue of being continued as opposed to having a new current permit. Yes, Mr. Chair, that is a possibility, but we find very rarely that there are permits that are not meeting water quality standards. And um, so when we renew those permits, we, we review all of the effluent data, the receiving water data, and propose new limits to meet water quality standards when those are required. And it is more the exception than the rule that we find limits need to be revised. Okay. Um, one last thing on the, the Lake Champlain TMDL and its relationship to that string of Otter Creek um, wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, so over this way, because of farming territory, my under <clears throat> my understanding is it depends on which part of the lake you're talking, which segment of the lake you're talking about, but they range the phosphorus loading is anywhere from five to 95% attributable to agricultural activities. So, uh, and I think the average for the state was something in the forties. Um, so is because this is farming territory over here is the, is the reason for the delay on the wastewater treatment facility repermitting because you're also uh, trying to figure out how that relates to other reductions in a totally different sphere, phosphorus uh, reductions that are primarily agricultural. I'm just trying to understand the interplay. So now we're switching from E. coli over to another insult to the environment, uh, phosphorus in this case. But. Um, so I can speak to the fact that the existing phosphorus limits were confirmed as supported for the Otter Creek. And so the Lake Champlain TMDL put those Otter Creek facilities last because the lake segments in the most troubled situation were prioritized first. Um, okay. there, I, there are several components to the all-in approach of the Lake Champlain TMDL and uh, the progress won't be made overnight, but the improvements are being made and that includes reissuance of the wastewater permits. Okay, great. Um. I don't want to forget to say, I appreciate whoever in your family is the artist. You have some nice artwork on, on the wall there. Um, the, uh, okay, so are there any more committee questions related to the, the topic, the discussion for the last hour? Um, because if there aren't, you know, we've also invited uh, a, uh, the department to talk to us about DEC housekeeping language for a bill uh, possibly that we would hope that we might be able to work on this. Well, we will work on it this session, whether we get all the way through passage, I'm not sure, but uh, we wanted to hear that language. Okay. So with that, thank you, Mr. Redmond. Thank you, Ms. Palacek. Um, Commissioner Walk, are you staying on and you're gonna uh, give us a tour of the DEC housekeeping language. I don't know. We have about half an hour. And I don't know if that's a, enough time to at least give us a high level walkthrough. So, yep. So I can, I can. So thank you to Brian and Amy for joining me for this portion. You guys are free to, <laughs> to go about your day. Um, the, uh, I, I, the, so I back, gosh, I think it was February sometime. The days all sort of run together. Um, I walked you through a PowerPoint presentation yep. of, of the proposed changes. Um, since then, uh, your colleagues in the House have actually asked uh, Mr. O'Grady to draft a, uh, a committee bill 
uh, which incorporates those pieces and other uh, some other items. Uh, I am happy to walk through the PowerPoint again and ask answer your questions or go th go through the, the houses <laughs> draft, but whatever is best for you. I, the PowerPoint might just be easier from a conversational perspective. Um, um, sure. Why not? You know, and uh, thanks for filling us in. I knew there was something in the works, but I, what I don't know, and perhaps you do, is their schedule for moving that bill. Um, did it make crossover? Um, it it is not made, did not make crossover. Uh, my understanding from from our conversations were that the two of you were in some conversation about whether or not there would be capacity on the calendar to address it yep. for the course of the end of the spring. Um, and we'd welcome that opportunity, but fully understand where you are and the priorities that the committee has set. Okay. Well, I suppose one question would be right off the bat is, is there, from the department's perspective, is there anything in there that's timely so you would like to have it online by July 1? Uh, there are a number of changes that we, we'd like to pursue, but the, again, these are sort of, these are technical corrections, areas where we've seen issues uh, with the, the law come up over time that we'd like to address. Uh, it does not necessarily, uh, they're not, if they were uh, individually high priorities, we would have brought them forward in a, in a different form. This is sort of a cleanup bill, if you will, um, to, to, to address some, some areas of concern that have come up over time. Okay. Um, well, so let me check with the committee because I think it may be, uh, now that I understand that there's something imminent from the house, perhaps it makes more, and you already did give us the preview, um, I guess it's two months ago, but as you say, it feels like it might've been a year ago at this point. Uh, and, uh, and rather than take it up a little bit now and then receive it from the house and go full in, I think it probably makes more sense to wait until we have that bill and then we'll just dig right in and get going. Um, uh, and so that gives us a little extra time before uh, Senator Percha arrives. Jude, if you could let him know that we could start as soon as 1030, um, maybe he can come sooner. I know that we were cutting it pretty close. Sure, I'll give it a try. Okay, thank you. He might not be able to come over. Um, before we lose the... Uh, Commissioner, I don't know if the committee wants to have any further discussion on, obviously, a, a very challenging topic. You know, I'd say uh, the only answer I hear, you know, underneath it all, to me, the strongest concerns I'm hearing about connecting anyone new to any system or any change of use suggests, you know, a, a and a, a moratorium. I mean, that's if you if someone really wanted to say, I am going to be as strict as possible about this. You're talking about a, a, a building and connection moratorium. I haven't heard it called that, but I it seems like that's the only uh, complete assurance someone could offer. And at a moment when we have a housing crisis and we're coming through a pandemic, I don't. I think we need a better answer than a moratorium. Um, not that someone's seriously proposing it, but it's it's just all but unstated that that's kind of where we're at on, on the issue. So I feel like we're in an unsatisfying position uh, and I wanna know where the committee is in terms of uh, coming to some sort of accommodation between two different points of view and continuing to uh, move forward. So I know where I am, but I don't want to impose. So uh, any committee discussion and anything people would like to ask the commissioner while he's still here. Okay. All right. Oh, Mr. 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 Chair, yeah. um, did, we are in an unsatisfying position. Um, one of the things that those of us that seek to be serve in the legislature is to go there 
and resolve situations that we we recognize as being um, in need of correction or satis to be satisfied. And we're here now. Um, and we're saying, well, we're not going to do anything because change is too difficult. Um, the administration is saying, don't worry. Um, we promise that, you know, I'm use the expression, we'll quit smoking in five or 10 years. And someone, a couple cartons of cigarettes have fallen off the back of the truck thanks to the pandemic. So everything is okay. Um, well, I don't believe that everything is okay and we should not be putting the stamp of approval on it. If we wanna stand up and say, it's not okay and these are the reasons and we don't have the, you know, the will or we're afraid that, that if we pass something, the governor will veto it, then let's say that. But don't, I, I'm astounded that we were told that the condition for approving additional sewage is that a plant that was designed 30 years ago, um, which we know is failing, um, is still recognized as the, mm -hmm. the fact that it was designed 30 years ago, that it's okay to put more sewage into it. Um, yeah, what, that's, is that not what we're doing? Um, with the anticipation that a miracle will take place in the next five or 10 years. So, um, if we can't see that, that see that and face it honestly and say we've been beaten, then I'm not prepared to say we declare success. So okay. if we have a solution that is okay. Yeah. Um, before we go to Senator McCormick, Senator Westman, I you have some I, thoughts. You've been. I, I, I think. I said what I wanted to say um, the other day. You know, if what you're doing is by shutting down and not allowing um, um, development where there are sewage treatment plants and where there are downtowns, you're going to put more pressure on the rural countryside. And not only does that, um, um, do you have the issue of the waste in the house to deal with. But then if you've um, broken up the countryside, you've cut down trees and you've created development, you're going to create more runoff um, in something that isn't directly related to the septic tank or related to um, the waste coming out of the house that. And so I'm not willing to say no to this when, um, when I know it's going to put pre more pressure on the rural countryside for development. I don't want that. And, you know, um, we're not in a good situation. But I, you know, th this to me is more than what's going to be the ways it shows up in that. The more houses with more driveways, the more houses with more um, the, um, breaking into the forest, the, with all of that, um, the more runoff you're going to have. And so um, it, it's way more complicated than um, what we're concentrating on. And what we're concentrating on is very important. And we've done a lousy job um, maintaining the infrastructure and advancing the in infrastructure in our communities that are downtown. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm just a point of clarification here. Are, we're yep. not, are you have, I'm looking at our agenda. This is just general committee discussion, correct? I mean, you, I don't see an, a vote. I don't see, can you just uh, clarify that for me? Yeah, sure. We, we actually voted out, uh, well, individual senators signed on to an amendment yeah. to tune up the language for S-101, sections 10 and 11. Um, I went to Senate Economic Development, presented that this morning. They asked a couple detailed questions that now I have the answers to and I'll get back to them. 
um, then because uh, of the testimony earlier this week, we wanted to check out these uh, expired permits. We wanted to ex check out 1272s, CSOs, and the relationship of this much bigger problem related to the adequacy or inadequacy of our wastewater treatment facilities in the state of Vermont to S10. To me, uh, S10 has sort of been a, just a triggering event for uh, to open the door to a much bigger discussion, which is an important one. And um, so I think, you know, we've had some useful suggestions like yours, your request for a prioritized list so that we can be strategic, particularly if we're able to pull down federal money that would help us pick up the pace. Um, but before going to Senator McCormick, I'd say, you know, all, I'll speak just for myself. We're in kind of a, I'll just say it this way, a lousy position. And it's because we've underfunded uh, chronically this kind of infrastructure investment. We get by, but we yep. also know municipalities are under stress. They're, they have so many things to do. A, another bond for yet another infrastructure project is always hard to move. And so I'd say... Um, we are where we are because we've got what we, we have what we paid for in the last 30 years. Um, and I'd say we all want to do better. And the question is how much better can we do how soon? Uh, to Senator um, uh, Westman's comment, I agree. You know, part of Love. my preference to find a solution in, to the problem in S10 is that we also, we've been talking smart growth and trying to, to have uh, less negative impacts on the environment broadly by supporting smart growth. Obviously, if we're gonna add some more septage to a system that does experience CSO events, there will be a negative impact. I guess the question is, we need to measure negative impacts against other negative impacts. It's, you know, it's the, it's not an absolute question. It's a compared to what question. And I think um, that's what, you know, we don't have a really uh, great clean answer for anyone. Well, it sounds like, and it sounds like we're already doing this, but this committee really needs to be working uh, hand in glove with the commissioner on making certain we understand what the funding opportunities are, when they're coming in, who should get them, how to prioritize them. It would be, and I know you're on it, Mr. Chair, uh, but we wouldn't want to look back and say we, we missed something. Right, right. Well, and uh, this is not meant to be defensive because obviously there is a real problem here. We worked hard and long on Act 64 and water quality. And we've addressed some of these things through a TMDL. Now, it doesn't mean that it's a bad plan, uh, you know, for not implementing at rapidly enough with enough money. Um, you know, I, I think we're on the right track, but there are a lot of ways in which we impair the, the waters of the state. We also made a uh, commitment to doing, Senator Walk, help me out here. I think our annual clean water Act investments are in the neighborhood of uh, 50 to 60 million on the state's part. You know, and we dedicated revenues to them. So someone could say, well, those are inadequate revenues. Um, we, we are in the pool competing with everyone else for worthy projects. And, and that's again, not a satisfying answer, I know. Um, Senator McCormick, you were, you've been yeah, waiting patiently. Thanks. We've got a, a, a couple of, of really weighty problems, like major problems, and we're being told that the way to deal with them is to, is to uh, make it easier to hook up to the sewage system. Uh, first of all, housing. We do have a housing crisis. Uh, there was a time when a 45-year-old man living in his mother's basement was a loser. These days, it's simply an economic reality. There are people working hard and doing well in their careers, and it's not good enough to meet the, uh, the rents or the, the, the expense of buying a house. Uh, 
uh, uh, there's a housing crunch. The other issue that Senator Westman mentioned is, is the, um, the need to uh, concentrate development in development centers uh, if, if we're going to preserve our, our countryside. And that has been a problem for years, more so now, uh, I think with um, the good news, the silver lining that came out of the COVID pandemic, which is that, that uh, you know, you can, you can work from home. Uh, there used to be a kind of an economic limiter on how much sprawl we were going to have in, in Vermont. But now you, you can live pretty much any place you want and still work. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at my mountain view from, um, you know, I'm not anywhere near a, a popular, well, I'm near the Pepple Village, if that counts as, as a population center. But I I think we, we need to uh, realize the housing crunch is basically a function of market forces. It is more profitable to build luxury housing than to build affordable housing. And uh, uh, I was looking at uh, an apartment I had in 1967 that I paid $52 a month for. This is not in Vermont, but this is happening nationwide. <laughs> this was in, in Brooklyn. The, the rent is $3,000 a month for my $52 a month apartment. Uh, and and so too in, in, in Vermont that that the properties that uh, I remember my grandfather laughing with delight because he had sold uh, some land for twenty dollars an acre he couldn't believe he'd done so well. Um, so it's market forces and market forces have made us a happy and prosperous nation and uh, um, all else being equal you go where the market takes you but not always. Sometimes the market takes you places you don't want to go. And then you need the will to, to that we are a democracy. We govern ourselves and we use our, our government to, uh, to manipulate the, uh, the, the, the market. The fact is um, houses are too expensive. As far as, as downtown development, the idea that the impediment to downtown development is permitting is stated almost as a given, as a self-evident that everyone knows this. It's not even really discussed much. People don't make the claim that permitting discourages downtown development. They sort of base their argument on that as though that point has already been settled. Um, Act 250 has been the villain for at least the uh, the 30 years I've been in the Senate and looking at, at earlier history, it goes right back to Dean Davis, that the reason that there's development you want and the reason it's not happening is because of big bad Act 250. I, I don't buy the argument. No one has ever actually substantiated it. And uh, meanwhile, we do have the responsibility to stop fouling our own nest, to stop fouling the water. And in that regard, I think with Senator Campion's comment about we want to be, know what resources may be coming our way before we start making um, uh, serious changes. Um, I think we probably want to hold off and be, be cautious and move with caution. Okay. I'll leave um, it at that. Well, thank you. Just, uh, you know, I'm looking at the clock. I see it's 1030 and I know the commissioner only had time before that's for till 1030. So thank you for staying with us. I just wanted to make sure that if the committee had anything they wanted to express back to the agency that um, we had that chance to do that while we're all together still. So thank you, uh, Commissioner Walk. Appreciate the time with the committee. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll... Senator Perchlick is due in 15 minutes. Um, but so before we <laughs> close out on this topic, uh, you know, I feel like we've been, uh, oh, he's, he's arriving right now. So we'll get to transition sooner rather than later. My sense is we have, uh, we made some requests for more information. Um, we'll be meeting with a congressional delegation. I hope it's next Thursday. Again, we're trying to assemble like seven people. So it's a little tricky. Um, but we're going to be meeting with them ASAP. We'll have the commissioner in. 
so he can be with us. You know, now I'm going to think aloud with the committee. I think it's probably a good idea to also invite in um, the Department of Public Service because on my cover email to the delegation, I said, you know, we'd like to hear about things related to energy, energy savings, weatherization, land conservation, wastewater treatment, um, and renewable energy generation, uh, and anything else. And I sent our committee of jurisdiction description to them so that anything they could imagine that applies to us, they would be prepared to talk about it. Senator Campion. Yeah, I would just say, um, I, I would recommend, Mr. Chair, but, uh, to hear from the delegation, uh, and that's it. Others could observe and listen and maybe weigh in here and there. But I think if we get too many people reporting and asking questions of one another, I don't think we're going to get what we really need to hear. And we really need to hear from the delegation. Um, yep. And we could allow the others to come in and respond at a different date. That would just be my recommendation. Otherwise, it okay. becomes a, an, a huge panel of people and we won't get what we need. I worry. Yep. No, so uh, thanks for that. Um, I actually wasn't thinking of having others in to be on the panel, but just so they could hear the uh, testimony in person. Sure. They can always hear. Uh, Zoom is a wonderful yeah. for everybody to. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's yeah. subscribe to our YouTube channel. Right. It's uh, one of the top performing channels in the state of Vermont this year. I've seen the uh, Nielsen data. All right. So, okay. Uh, with that, before we move on, Senator, uh, to hearing from Senator Perchlick, um, any final thoughts? You want to share the disposition? I will. It's not going to be on the bill. Excuse me. One on one won't be on the floor till I believe next uh, week. I think it's still in the probes. Uh, just came out of finance. Um, so we'll have a time to consult amongst ourselves. I will uh, reach out to you and you know. I think and and uh, put together as productive a path forward as possible, acknowledging that it, there are troubles that we are definitely not solving uh, in this bill at this moment, uh, S101 that is. Okay, with that, I'd like to welcome Senator Perchlick to the committee. Um, I don't know if everyone knows of Senator Perchlick's, uh, besides his time at the department, history, prior to that involved in energy, renewable energy, et cetera. Um, so we've been having conversations sort of on the side um, about issues that could be addressed in the form of S109. And I had asked Senator Perchlick to visit with the committee and share his thoughts. You know, if, if something sort of catches hold, then we can go to the more formal stage of maybe drafting or talking about uh, an allocation, et cetera, taking more testimony on an idea. But as a way to jumpstart the conversation, um, just asking him to visit with us this morning and share some ideas, um, including perhaps around advanced wood heat, which we've talked about, but not very steadily this session. So good morning, Senator Perchlick. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you. It's great to be in your committee and see my fellow senators. So there's there's two things that I would just focus on. Um, and I know one of them you've talked about, I just don't know how much you've talked about. And that's either the pays system, as people call it, or pays like system pays you save, what we would call a tariff to the meter financing system for either energy savings you know, thermal energy efficiency projects, or it could be any other, it could be energy generation projects. So I, I'm hoping that we find a way to, to make that happen. It's something that we've tried and talked about for a long time in Vermont, but we've never had the money to do it because it needs right. startup money. And right. so it seems like this is an opportunity to move on that. I'm happy to talk more sure. about it. That's one of my interests. And, and as you said- Okay, uh, and can I just give you a quick, uh, Sure. A answer on that one. So um, we we took our first testimony on that maybe five weeks ago, and then we've been uh, dipping back in and out of it and working with folks outside 
the committee as well. So I think we're very, you know, I suppose the most concrete way we expressed our interest was setting aside pilot money to stand up a, a pays uh, program. And we just had utilities in yesterday. So we'll continue the conversation. There's an opportunity. Um, I was just in appropriations yesterday uh, to bring, even though we don't have the bill, to bring additional language down the hall and be able to make modifications. So the, I think what we're, all the parties we've talked to, DUs, VHFA, EVT, et cetera, um, there's a lot of interest in uh, VIPSA, um, how, what's the most effective strategy to try to get a pilot going, basically. Um, right. uh, might state money be oriented to um, things that could create sort of a shared resource, uh, as in maybe a turnkey solution that any utility could sign up for, uh, a loan loss reserve that any utility could take advantage of, back office processing that any utility could you know, use. Uh, maybe that's the, the most cost-effective way to prime the pump. Or maybe it's that one utility takes it and runs and we all watch and learn from that. So I think we're, we're open to seeing basically who comes forward with the best proposal. I think that's part of it too, right? We wanna, if there's money available, we're hoping that spurs um, someone committing and stepping up to um, work on it. Okay, that's good news. And I hope that VHFA is involved or we're trying to get them involved so that in the future, if it's successful with their bonding authority, they could, that then that it could be self-replicating with their bonding yep. as we go forward. Um, advanced wood heating is something that the state has been focusing on particularly a lot with the last five, six years. The Clean Energy Development Fund in, in 2015 did a strategic plan and got out of the solar, basically got out of all other renewable generation and said, the best bang for the buck for the state is advanced wood heating when it comes to, to renewable energy. That that's that's where the state should focus and, and, and that the state should focus on because it was hard, it's hard to move the needle if you're pushing 12 needles. So focus on advanced wood heating was the strategic goal and the state has done a good job of working collaboratively amongst economic development, forest and parks, Division of uh, Environmental Conservation Air Quality Division, Air, which is now the Climate and Air Quality Division um, under Heidi Hales, and, and the Department of Public Service, all, all working together. It's like, how can we advance this sector and clean up our air and support the forest products industry? And that's, it's been successful, but the funding that we've had from the Clean Energy Development Fund is going away. The legislature did give the CDF and DEC a couple hundred thousand dollars to, to focus on wood stove change downs, which was good. And that, based on that success, Efficiency Vermont started doing wood stove change outs and thermal efficiency incentives for like pellet boilers. But they get their money, as you all know, from, you know, Reggie. And with the Reggie allowances, the, the money from Reggie and forward capacity going down, they don't have the same money. So they're pulling back on their incentives for, for boilers and they just reduced their, or on April 1st, they reduced their wood stove incentive from 650 to, down to $200, I think. And there's, there isn't, the, just isn't the same kind of money to keep going. And so what I'm particularly interested in is more stove change outs because that's how we clean the air. That's how air quality is interested in, it, in this. And I think there would be an opportunity to work with them for more particulate monitoring. We only have three air emission monitoring stations in the whole state. And it would be good to be, there's these new, I don't know if you've heard about them, purple, purple air, I think they're called, smaller um, monitoring stations that we could place around the state and and then target stove change outs for certain areas. And right now we know some certain areas are bad but based on modeling and it would be good to, to have some more monitoring out there, some more data that we can have on particulates. But the, from the stations we have, particulates are going down uh, partly because of other air pollution emissions progress that we've been making. 
So we can we can increase wood and decrease particulates, but we need to do it mainly through these kind of stove change out programs, getting rid of the old ones, getting rid of coal. We still have people heating with coal, not a lot, but we're trying to find those people and, and give them incentives to get out of the coal. Some people are willing to switch from cordwood to pellets. Um, some people are totally not willing to do that. But those that are, uh, it's a good way to, to reduce emissions, but stay with a local renewable source. And there's a lot of opportunities to increase pellet, uh, kind of infrastructure or pellet uh, supply market in the state and also dry chips or dry manufactured chips. So that's all kind of a, a short way of saying that if we have one-time money that's around keeping Vermonters warm, I think there's a real opportunity to do more in the advanced wood heating market and hope that we could find a way to put some money towards that. Okay, um, right. And you know, one thing we're saying about this one-time money, we're saying it's one-time money, but that, we're, that the planning we're doing right now is to allocate it over two years um, so that we, uh, any kind of step up in any kind of programming we give ourselves the opportunity to find additional funding next year so that we maintain it after the one time is gone. That's going to be our, our biggest challenge next legislative session, I'd say, as a body. Um, and um, because we, we actually have a lot of knowledge about what the good things to do are. Uh, it's not like we're wondering for the most part. Um, Senator Campion. And then Senator McDonald. Senator Senator Briggs. Senator Persick, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of what, when you talk about uh, filters, I mean, you're talking about on everyday households, also, you're talking about in certain companies, you're talking, can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, the monitor, if I said filters, I misspoke. I meant to say monitors is for particulates. If there are ones you can just put on homes, you could have like a community science kind of project where you engage with people, train them to put these systems on, on their homes. But um, I was thinking, you know, you work with, with other state buildings in to find locations for these, but you could also put them on schools and, and places like that. I mean, so I it's just, a, so it's just a monitor. It's not a, um, yeah, so it's not, not it's just Sorry. collecting data. Just collecting data. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, and I think it's great that you're mentioning that because you know the downside on wood burning is particulate emissions, especially the the nanometer stuff uh, that ends up going into lungs and actually can get right into your bloodstream. So we would. It's great that we support the forced products economy. It's great that we're recycling money within Vermont. It's not so great if we end up uh, poisoning ourselves along the way. So, right. uh, and, well, and that's why I think it's important to have the Division of Air Quality involved. And, and when we did the scope change out, I think the legislature actually gave the money to air quality and they gave the money to CDF to run it because CDF had the kind of infrastructure to do that. But they said, you know, we're going to, you know, have veto over the, details of the program. Because EPA and the EPA just made new standards this year on all wood burning appliances. And the difference between a wood stove that you buy today and a wood stove that you bought, you know, 20 years ago is dramatic. You know, it's like 40 parts per million versus, you know, one part. It's the, the particulate matter in particular has <laughs> been drastically reduced and the efficiency has been greatly increased. So they burn less wood overall because there's more efficient burners. And then for each BTU you get out of it, you're emitting a lot less particulates. So th that's how we can reduce overall particulates, but still have, you know, relying on this local renewable energy source that we have. And it goes to the, you know, what you've heard about the, the market for the low grade, low grade wood. All right, have we had, testimony in finance, we had Chris Brooks come in and talk about the possibility of standing up an associated 
a wood chip plant that might use waste heat or might use actually for its, might put its own emissions out through the Rygate stack to take advantage of its scrubber, things like that. Um, who knows what, uh, what will come out of it? So l let me address just one really quick question, quick question. Um, then we'll go to Senator Campion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, no, I'll, I'll, I'll pause. <laughs> well, the, the, it, it is that the, we get regular feedback in this committee about why do we support wood when it's a net, you know, we're, we're setting more CO2 up into the air and the 80 year cycle is not in keeping with the need to be much more aggressive in terms of addressing climate change. So you've made peace with that in some way. I'd like to understand how you've thought it through. Yeah, and the Clean Energy Development Fund has, has written up a couple things that I could, I could send you and how we, how we talk about that. But basically my view is our number one goal is to switch off of fossil fuels. And there's a lot of fossil fuel heating systems that are not gonna switch to any other renewable source anytime soon. And using wood to do that is, is something that's, that's very uh, doable and embraced by the, the folks that own these fossil fuel systems. They like the idea of doing wood and that, that lowers our fossil fuel out, output. And fossil fuel is just carbon that, that should be kept in the ground where the, the forest carbon is this, you know, you know carbon that, that has been cycling in the atmosphere in a, in a much more small time frame than the carbon that's captured in the fossil fuels. So just overall, we, we look at it, if you're doing good forest management, this is carbon that can be cycling in and out. We agree that it's emitting carbon. We're not trying to say that it's not, but that uh, the higher goal of ending our dependence on fossil fuels makes that, you know, a, a, a beneficial um, policy that we're, with all the other benefits of using wood, if we can limit our fossil fuel use and recycle the carbon that we're releasing from burning of the wood, then we're in a, in a net positive. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator McDonald. Well, actually, Senator Campion, I, you had been on deck. All right, did you have something you wanted to follow up with? Then we'll go to Senator McDonald. All right, he has stepped away from his screen. So, uh, Senator McDonald. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, we, 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 you, I, I think the, the biggest challenge that we're gonna have after we train people to go to work um, is gonna be getting the customers to sign up for it. And I thought uh, Senator Perchlick was had worked on some on the uh, the pays program and how to um and how that might be useful in our plans if he had some details or on how to put that forward so that um, we can put the workforce and any money we have available have it taken up by the citizenry yeah, to to weatherize. Yeah I mean the, the, the benefit is that it's it's so much easier than other financing measures since it's tied to your meter. And there isn't the same financial requirements about doing a loan. So you don't have all the rules around loaning people money. You don't have to do the credit checks. It's really just about, is there a meter there? And will there be somebody living there? And even if there's a vacancy, the money will get paid back uh, since it's under the regulated tariff. And that makes it a lot easier to sign people up or you know, have people sign up than, than any other financial method. There's other issues. It's not perfect for everything, but that's why I like the idea of doing, doing a PAYS project and doing other innovative um, financing mechanisms and seeing what can work and then what works, that's where we, we put the money in once, once it's proven. So, Mr. Chair, you, our draft bill looks at uh, at on the meter, but pay the the you know the, the pays program has is, differs slightly, and are both of those going to be looked at in the study in the the folks that are working on how to perfect this during next fall? Yeah, uh, yeah. So we refer to to the meter as well as on meter bill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's important to me that it's a tariff to the meter system. 
Right. Well, it's important that our program is embraced and uh, welcomed by the people we ask to step up and use it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. But, yeah. And that's part uh, of the, uh, yeah. I'll just say that's part of the cost. Why, why we haven't done it yet. It's because you need to do a lot of kind of education and set up costs to get it done. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right. I mean, part of what one of the barriers is, ironically, that it almost sounds too good to be true. And um, because it is novel, and people have to hear about it, understand it, and then say, oh, well, this, now that I understand it better, um, wh why I, I would love to sign up for such a thing, you know. Um, uh, Senator McCormick, did I see your hand up before? No. Are you all set? Okay. Um, <coughs> Senator Westman. No any, okay. Um, one other thing. Uh, so uh, Senator Pritchlick, if you could maybe, uh, I don't know if it needs to be drafted as a bill, you could go that far if you like, uh, or just to write up um, advice to us as to how we might implement uh, something around advanced wood heat. Um, because it, if it turns out that, so the committee needs to decide, we've been focused mostly on weatherization, but we've also, part of what's built into this bill is the concept of reducing carbon intensity and um, making what we propose here, anticipate the possibility of a clean heat standard. So uh, we're talking heating and heating appliances uh, sort of on the edge of the bill. And so maybe this is a, a place for us to go. Uh, if you had, for instance, ideas on what a program would look like, uh, what a budget would be, um, that would be helpful to the committee because in the end, we're gonna need to nail down that kind of details. If you had implementation ideas about how we should make sure that the investigations between now and next January would be most productively framed to make sure that um, to the meter, for instance, were addressed, um, that could be helpful to us. And then we could check in with you like next week again and continue the conversation. I, I will say it does fit right in with our discussions about um, cleaner heating equipment. And we did have those, those discussions, but not in the detail that Senator Perchlick brings up. And I appreciate the fact you know, we're in this position with almost everything we talk about. Um, they're not perfect choices and we're not gonna have um, a, a perfectly clean um, thermal heating system, but this moves us in the right direction. And I applaud that. But um, we, did, we did talk about how we address the heating systems and get and swap them out for cleaner stuff. Because if we can't do that, once someone buys a furnace, once somebody buys a wood stove, it's gonna be in their house for the next 20 to 25 years. And we need to put the cleanest thing we can afford to do in now. Exactly. Mr. Chair, if I may just recommend, if, if there's a preference, I would prefer a bill, personally, something that we can respond to, uh, that would be incredibly helpful if Senator Perslick's willing to go in that direction. Okay, I think um, that's sure. Time and, uh, and again, give us something from which right. to work. Okay. Which, right. which ledge council would you recommend I talk to? So Ellen has been, uh, Ms. Tchaikovsky has been drafting for the committee on this. And, um, you know, another form you could do it in, I mean, I appreciate Senator Campion's remark. In the end, we need to get that precision and the language. So let's go for it right from the get-go. Um, the other thing is, um, if you do it as an amendment, you know, then that's a very portable form. We could work with that in lots sure. of ways. Great. I just didn't want to start <clears throat> testimony without having something. That's my, my thought. Point well taken. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> the, other, the, the other way. <laughs> All right. So it is. And I just um, say before we leave with Ms. Uh, Senator Perchlick here, any opportunity that 
um, you think this committee and the transportation committee can work together, um, please approach us. Will do. Thank you for the Great. time. See yeah. you on the floor. Uh, Senator McCormick, I mean, Senator McDonald, last word to you. Uh, Senator Pritchard, did the, did the getting the electric vehicle drivers bill that uh, would pay for road maintenance get into your committee yesterday or the day before? Uh, I think it did. I did see it, but we haven't talked about it. I haven't talked okay, about so um, would, if you have a you know, so a couple hours before the T-bill, if your committee has, before the T-bill gets discussed, um, that's, that'll be the only, T-bill will be the only vehicle to, probably the only vehicle to um, to work on that stuff. So thank you. Thank right. you for letting me that, know that. And I'm looking forward to to uh, getting in there and answering some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, it's 1058. 